Hello, hello. Welcome to the 17th uh, International Book Fair of uh, Thessaloniki. I'm very happy to be here and uh, talk to you. Uh, we are here to talk about your novel, uh, The Man Who Came Uptown. Uh, Patakis Editions, very good translation by uh, Antonis uh, Kalokiris. But I am tempted to ask you first about the United States presidential election, if you are happy with the result, if you are worried with something? No, I'm happy with the result. Uh, we won and, um, and uh, it'll all be okay. You know, it's, it's all gonna work itself out. Democracy will prevail. Okay, that, that's a good thing to, uh, to think about. So, I'll make a small, a short introduction in Greek. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, George Pelekanos is a Greek Hellenic metanaston from the Sparta and was developed as a systematic polemic of the taxic and philatic racism. He was developed as a chronographer of Washington. And here, 28 years ago, from the first time of his birth, στα ε, αμερικανικά γράμματα, ήταν 35 αρις τότε, και με τα μεθυστορήματά του, που διαδραματίζονται πίσω από την καλογιαλισμένη βιτρίνα της Washington και με τις δημοφιλείς τηλεοπτικές σειρές που εμπνέει ως σεναριογράφος αλλά και ως παραγωγός, είναι γνωστό, το βλέπουμε στην Ελλάδα, το The Wire, και με την προσωπική του ζωή όμως, γιατί με τη γυναίκα του έχουν υιοθετήσει δύο αγόρια από την Αφροαμερικανική κοινότητα και ένα κορίτσι από τη Γουατεμάλα, ο Τζόρτς Πελεκάνος αγωνίζεται να καταδείξει και να θεραπεύσει την τοξική δυναμική των φιλετικών και των ταξικών αντιθέσεων, το racial divide που λέει, που γεννούν την εγκληματικότητα. Σε ένα βιβλίο του, το The Night Gardener, ο κυπουρός της νύχτας, λέει «Poverty is violence». Ε, ο Πελεκάνος είναι ίσως ο μεγαλύτερος εν ζωή συγγραφέας αστυνομικών ιστοριών. Το λέει ένας πολύ μεγάλος, ο Στίβεν Κίνγκ. So, uh, George Pelecanos, you were uh, 11 years old when you heard Martin Luther King speech in Washington. Four days later, he was assassinated. Half a century after that, black people still get killed in the US. So what's happening with the democracy in the US? In your novel, we see uh, a sort of rise of a new Ku Klux Klan. Somebody says that in the novel. And, uh, do you think that the Black Lives Matter movement will uh, help to change things? Sure. The, um, you mentioned the, uh, uh, the assassination of Dr. King, and um, it was at, right after his assassination, in fact, that night that the riots started in Washington, D.C., and around the country. But I remember the riots very clearly. Um, uh, my papu had a had a uh, a diner right in the middle of the riots, and so it was part of our family was very concerned about it. But looking back on it with perspective, the riots, um, even though there was a lot of damage and and uh, burning and looting and that sort of thing, it's my opinion, and it's and it, and it is sort of a controversial opinion that. Um, sometimes riots are necessary because if you look at the history of that of those of that era, uh, Amer America had basically been in a position where they they sympathized with uh, with the blacks and they were on the right side of the civil, civil rights movement, but they weren't really doing anything about it, hmm. and it was it was a stagnant movement. And what happened was is that when the uh, when the riots happened, America s sat up and took notice. They got scared. And the civil rights movement accelerated 
by about 10 years in that one weekend. So if you come to the present now and you look at what's happening here, um, people today are also not happy with um, some of the uh, violent um, and, and nonviolent protesting in the cities, but it's made people, it's made Americans take notice and, and realize that something has to, something has to change, something has to happen again, or we're going to descend into, um, into, into more serious division and more serious violence. So these things work, you know, as much as people don't want to admit it, they work. Yes. I agree. Uh, so let's let's come to your to your novel now. The man who came uptown. Uh, tell us who is the man who came uptown. Without without uh, spoiling the thrill. <laughs> no, it's uh, the term uh, uptown is is slang here, and what it means is when you're when you're incarcerated, and you get out, they say you're going uptown. And, and it doesn't mean that, you know, uptown connotes like uh, a luxurious living and wealth and all that. It doesn't mean that. It just means you're going home. And it means you're going to a better place than, uh, than you've been. So, so this is Michael Hudson, your protagonist. Yes. And while he's locked up awaiting trial, he gets turned on to books by the, uh, the jail librarian. And like a lot of guys in, in lockup, he had never really read books before because um, it, it didn't interest him. It wasn't part of his life. He had, uh, you know, not much of an education. And, but when you're locked up and you're looking for something to do, you, a lot of people turn to books and, and many get turned on to reading in a big way for the first time in their life. So he, when he gets out, all he really wants to do is go home to his mother's house, get a job, which he does, and get a library card, which he also does. And he wants to li live a peaceful life. And, um, and he can't because a, a guy, a, a private detective has, has gotten him out uh, by subverting the trial process and now being a witness and now Michael Hudson has to do a favor for this guy which is criminal in nature and that's the central conflict of the novel will he go back to his own life or will he proceed move forward and uh, just lead a um, sort of a simple peaceful life reading books and and going to work every day you yourself have um worked in, in uh, juvenile facilities and uh, I think that you were doing the same job as Anna, your second protagonist, the, the librarian in, in prison. Uh, do you want to, to tell us about this, uh, this experience of, your, of yours? I started out uh, going to juvenile um, facilities where they incarcerate basically kids, you know, people in their teens. And I was doing reading programs with them through uh, the uh, Penn Faulkner Foundation, and um, it was part of their program. And then I, and, and then I got sort of branched out, and I started going to um, adult prisons and jails, and and doing um, reading programs and writing programs with the individuals who were incarcerated. And I met at the DC jail, which is a holding facility like Rikers Island in New York. I met a, um, a librarian there named Danielle. And I got really interested in, in her because um, if you look at my, my, you know, my body of work, there's always somebody in my books who is doing good out there in the community and trying to, trying to make change with people at their own personal expense, meaning they could probably be working in a better job, a higher paying job, but they're out there, they've sacrificed to do this. And I really admire those people, as well as people who go to work every day. You know, I just think it's a heroic. Um, you are talking yes. about people who give, give a second chance to other people who are in a very difficult uh, position. 
There w yes. There's always that in, in, in your novels, the second yeah. chance. And it can be a teacher, it can be a volunteer, it can be anybody, but mm. in this case it was this librarian because I saw what she was doing and, and she was really impacting people's lives, genuinely. So I wanted to, that's enough for me to write a book and that's, that was the impetus of it. And I, and I constructed a, a, um, a situation where uh, Michael Hudson sort of falls in love with her in a way, not a, not a physical love, but he loves her because of what she's done for him. And when he gets out, because D.C. is sort of a small town, and, and people don't realize that, but in, as far as cities go in America, it's a, <laughs> it's a small town you know, on, on a scale. And he runs into her. It turns out she lives in, in the adjoining neighborhood to where his mother lives. So they begin mm -hmm. a relationship. And again, it's not a, it's not a um, romantic or physical relationship, but it is a relationship based on love. And, um, and he helps her out and she helps him out as well. Okay. So, uh, but uh, tell us also about your uh, other protagonists, because the, the, the relation that uh, Michael and Anna have, it's one thing, and then it's uh, this uh, private investigator who, who tries to put him in a difficult situation, but for, for a good reason, he says. Uh, this is very interesting. And then there is a cop, a uh, retired one, who is a bit violent. And then there are uh, these white-collar uh, people who are uh, surrounding them. Tell us a bit about uh, these, uh, this, the rest of your uh, protagonists. Well, I, I, over the years, I've befriended a lot of um, uh, ex-cops, and, um, and some of whom became bail bondsmen here and also private detectives. And, and some of these guys do side jobs where they, um, where they go into, um, you'd be surprised how many, for example, how many kidnappings there are in the city. Like you have two people, two sides are beefing about something, they're arguing about something and they'll, they'll take somebody's wife Oof. and they'll hold her hostage. And this kind of stuff never makes the newspapers. It doesn't get reported to the police. And these detectives and, and ex-cops who are now working sort of security jobs, they go in there and they rescue people and they, or they mediate these things. And, but a couple of them that I've gotten to know that were honest with me have sort of blurred that line and started doing illegal things themselves. They, they said, well, you know, there's this guy who's, let's say there's somebody who's a, a pimp or a drug dealer um, you know, that money was ill gotten and I'm going to get some of it myself and they'll mm -hmm. go in there and rob somebody. Mm -hmm. So these are based on actual, um, actual people that I've met. And, and then the, uh, one of the things that, uh, Ohanian, I mean, uh, Ornasian, who's mm -hmm. Armenian, the, the detective, I didn't make him Greek this time. I made him yes. Armenian. But he's orthodox. <laughs> <laughs> he's orthodox the as the Greeks Greek. are. Yeah. Um, the, my friend, my private detective friend told me about a case where um, he was hired by these parents to find out what happened at a wild party at their house. They had, these people had money and uh, they were away for the weekend and their daughter threw a party and the daughter got raped uh, by people who showed up at the party that they, that she didn't know. And there was a lot of drugs and drinking and that kind of thing, as you can imagine. And, and the parents were more concerned with keeping it away from the authorities than they were. Um, they just wanted to find out who, who destroyed their property. They didn't want to find out who raped their daughter. And <laughs> yes. my friend, the private detective, was sort of outraged by this. And, and he was telling me this story. And, and, and again, I, I, I hear stuff like that, and it makes me want to write about it. And it also took me into that oh, world of white supremacy. <laughs> Because I made the guys who come to the party, you know, white supremacists, and they're yes. they're, they're uh, rampant around here. Believe it or not, within within 50 miles of Washington D.C., there's all kinds of clans, clan cells, and people like that who are, who are holed up and doing stuff on the internet and that kind of thing. So it's real. 
Yes, and you are talking also about the uh, uh, gentrification of uh, certain areas in, in Washington that has changed the social um, um, image or um, uh, situation mm -hmm. there. And this is interesting because uh, we have seen uh, the riots uh, uh, for um, Trump now and it was really uh, a bit uh, uh, violent, it seemed violent. Everybody. Well, yeah, I mean, there, people were clashing and the police did a good job of, uh, of keeping order, uh, the local police. Um, not so much the, uh, the people, the people that were brought in by Trump actually created more violence. Um, there's a kid on my block. He's not a kid. He's, he's in his mid twenties. He's a, he's a medical student at uh, Georgetown university. And he went down there to help people because he know, you know, he's been working in hospitals and he knows how to treat people. Mm. He went down there and he had his medical kit and everything. And he was helping somebody who had been, um, who was um, tear gassed, pepper sprayed, and they were on the ground and he was picking them up and they shot, they shot him with rubber bullets, these guys oh. who Trump brought in. And uh, I saw his, he took his shirt off and showed me, he had welts all over his, his body from the rubber bullets. Rubber bullets, if they hit you in the eye or something like of that, course. they'll take your eye out. They're just as lethal. It's a projectile. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the local police did a pretty good job, but the, but the people that the feds brought in were, were did a very poor job, and they incited more violence. So uh, let's let's return to the novel. I think that uh, reading your novel, one could create a, a, a library. You are so generous with your uh, your other your other authors. So generous. You are. Uh, presenting them, you're presenting uh, the way they write. Uh, I think that uh, your your novel should be taught in, in uh, I don't know, in uh, literary crit criticism uh, classes or or, or uh, <laughs> in in university. Um, how is it? Um, your novel is um, uh, dedicated to Elmore Elmore uh, Leonard. Hmm? And mm -hmm. um, uh, sorry, Charles and uh, yes, and Charles Williford. Uh, do you want to tell us about them? Why? Why these uh, these two uh, writers? Uh, well, they're they're first of all, I love books, obviously, and, mm -hmm. and yes, um, and I and the book and this novel is sort of a love letter to to reading books, yes. which I think the pandemic has showed us that. Um, books are going to be around forever. If you remember a few years ago, there everybody was talking about the death of novels, and books, e-books were going to take over. People weren't going to read books anymore. That's not the case. I think people are reading now more than ever, and, and a lot of people have fallen in love with reading again. Yes, uh, and, and with the with the book as a as a an object. The, the, yeah, there's no substitute yeah. for holding holding a yeah. book in your hand. You know. Yeah. Um, I, I consider the book itself, you know, the book itself, I consider it a work of art. It, it, it's, it's an object of art. A, a Kindle or an e-reader is not, it's just a machine. So, um, you know, I wanted to talk about that, what books mean to people. And some of these writers, Elmore Leonard was a big influence on me. Mm. Um, I got to be friendly with him before he died, and um, he was a gentleman. He's a good guy. Charles Williford, um, the a lot of people aren't going to get this illusion, but um, the last line of the novel, <clears throat> of my novel, echoes the last not line of his novel, Pick Up, oh, yes. uh, in which, in which, the the protagonist's race is not revealed until the end of the novel. And a lot of people haven't picked up on this, but nobody in this book, in The Man Who Came Up Town, is identified by race. It's never yes, a point yes. where... You never do it. You, you, never, uh, uh, you never do it. The, the, the reader understands, but through another... 
exactly. Other way. I hope they I hope they understand. I mean, it was it was a concern of mine to do this, but I thought it was time to do it. Um, you know, it, it's always bothered me that when I read a book by a white writer, and they say, and then I met a black man standing on the corner, right? Yes. But if the, if the man on the corner is white, they don't say white man. They only identify the race if they're black or Hispanic or, and it bothered me. And by the way, you know, black writers do it too. It's a natural thing to do because it's the other, right? It's the other, it's the other. Yes, but it's, here you have Latinos too. You never, yeah. uh, you don't describe them Latinos. Okay. It's, it's like that. It's, it's, um, it's very important the way I, that I you do it. I tried yeah. it, you know, I, I tried it. I don't know if it works or not, and I, and I hope to keep doing it. Um, you have to work a little bit harder, but then you don't come with any preconceived notions of who the characters are, and which we all bring that baggage to the reading experience. When we read a book and, and the, the people are Im immediately identified as black or white or Hispanic, you bring these preconceived ideas about those characters. Of course. And I didn't want that to, uh, to get in the way of the, of the story. So anyway, I tried it. Yes, and, and I think that you, you did the, you, uh, the, you worked in the same way um, when you had um, Greek-American um, uh, detectives and uh, cops and protagonists in your books. You have... In, in many of your books, there are Greek Americans, but they are not always the good guy. They are not idealized. They are not the, the people we, we, we have seen uh, in, uh, I don't know, in Nia Vardalos' uh, uh, marriage, Greek marriage, Ramos uh, They no. are, uh, how, what did you want to do with the, this Greek American? Uh, protagonists of yours. I'm talking about Spiro Lucas, I'm talking about Nick Stefanos. Uh, uh, right. I, I mean, look, I, from the very beginning, my, my intention was to humanize us, mm. and which means all, all facets of, of a character, including the, the negative ones. Um, you're right, it's been, in America, the, the Greeks tend to be romanticized by by Greek Americans, yes, and that means that they're they're put up on a different level than others. And um, you know, I love Greeks too. I love being Greek American and and everything. But if if you do that, there's no complexity there, and it's it separates us in a bad way, in in a in, in a in a way that's not true, that's not honest. Um, and, uh, you know, so I just want to tell the truth and, and it's not, I don't deliberately try to, um, I won't make a Greek character, um, have negative traits just to have them, but I will do it if it's appropriate for that character. And, and I think it's, I think it's better for us in the long run. And, and you're trying to make, you know, you're trying to hope you leave, hopefully you leave some kind of legacy with your work. And I think it's better for the work. It's more, it's more complex, and uh, and and it's more uh, true. And, and you do the same thing uh, with your scenarios in in uh, the wire. For example, the the, the Greeks in in your uh, TV series, the TV uh, shows are are uh, the people who run uh, the nightlife in Baltimore. I mean, they're not the best of the best uh, good people. I mean, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's very courageous, uh, I think. Well, they, it's, it's funny because um, when, I, when I was on The Wire, the, the very first season, and uh, David Simon, he wanted to hire me to, to come back on full time second season. And, and I wasn't sure that I was going to do it. And he said, come on, man, I need you. Like, we're going to have a bunch of Greeks in this. In this so. <laughs> And so, uh, so I did it. And there's there's people speaking Greek in the show and mm -hmm. all this. So as you mentioned, there some of them are bad guys. Mm -hmm. But at the end, if you remember, um, 
the guy who they call the Greek says to somebody, I'm not even Greek. <laughs> you know, well, Simon, Simon kind of tricked me into, into work, working on the show um, by making these guys Greek. But yeah, yeah, that was a good season. Okay. Uh how do you work when you when you write scenarios? Uh, do you work as a as if you were writing a short story, or it's totally different uh, from the way you you are working when you are writing um, fiction, a novel? The the screenplays are yes, they're different. Uh, obviously, um, it's it's more it is collaborative. So mm. you have a writers' room who. Uh, critiques your work and everything, which I don't, honestly, I don't really like it, but it's necessary. Um, when I when, as a novelist, I, I control everything. I control my work and the finished product and everything. So, um, but it's something I had to get used to, but it also, I realized early on when I started writing screenplays that if I was to get as much control as possible over my screenplays and over what they became, when they hit the screen, the finished product, I would have to become a producer <laughs> and a showrunner. Okay, yes. And that's what I, that was my goal because I didn't like handing over a script and watching it get uh, changed so much. And, and I wanted to control the process just like I do in novels. But I will say that it's, it's a myth that um, screenwriting is somehow easier than writing a novel. In many ways, it's more difficult because you have to convey the same amount of <clears throat> information and emotion strictly through dialogue and action rather than prose in which you can impart all kinds of information through backstory and getting into it. You know, you can you can just say what a character is thinking. You can't do that in a script because you can't you can't go into somebody's head. So in a way, it's it's a different kind of writing, but it's just as hard, and I take it just as seriously. I've come across novelists who um, who we've hired actually on shows, who've come in thinking that this is going to be easy and much easier than writing a book, and they've said so, and they haven't they haven't done very well because they didn't take it as seriously as they do their books. And you have to you sweat as much blood writing a script as you do writing a novel. Uh, Daniel Mendelssohn, the critic and uh, writer, he says that uh, these uh, series, this show in HBO, were a, should be a school for new uh, new novelists, for young no novelists, for for fiction in in the future. He says that it was it is very important what is being done there. I mean, maybe not everything, but. Uh, that it has changed the the way the novelists themselves uh, see the, the the way they are writing and their um, uh, approach. I think you know. I think it's opened the door for a new kind of writing mm -hmm. in in in, uh, in, in screenwriting. Is a different. It's much different than it used to be. I used to look at scripts. Um, when I was starting out and, you know, Hollywood scripts and network television, and there was a lot of white space. They, they, there would be one line of, of action and then dialogue and then another one line of action or a word. And if you look at my scripts, they're written uh, very much the way novels are written. There's it's long paragraphs of, of description. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and, and that's, and, and one of the reasons, that I've been, been able to do that is because I never worked um, on a, a network show. I never, I, did, I wasn't working in Hollywood. All this stuff was off the grid. You know, we were sort of this rene renegade group of guys that um, were, were break, sort of breaking the rules and nobody was watching uh, <laughs> us. Yeah. And that, so I didn't get any bad habits and I, and, and we write differently. We also hire people who were not, traditional screenwriters. Okay. I'll go after people who I'll read a book, you know, I'll read a novel and I'll say, well, this, this woman or this man is, could be a good screenwriter because 
of their dialogue and their description and that kind of thing. And I don't care if they've never written a script before, um, because that can be taught. That's a that's a okay. format that yes. you learn. I'm looking for good writers. Yes, that's interesting what you say. Yes, uh, which uh, which one uh, of your novels? Not which one, which novels? Uh, do you prefer or do you consider that were m most important for you and for your um, job as you were? Getting uh, more, uh, you had more experience as a uh, as a writer, as a novelist. Well, I, there's uh, one book that I go back to is Hard Revolution, which you mm. mentioned in the very beginning. Yeah. Um, and and it, it where was Nick very Stephanos is a, a protagonist there, isn't it? Nick Stephanos. A, uh, no. Uh, no, he, it's um, um, it's a Derek Strange novel. Ah, okay, the, okay, okay, okay. Yes. The kid in the kid in the beginning who walks out of Saint Sophia, mm. uh, Greek Orthodox Cathedral, which is my church, where my mother taught Sunday school for twenty five years, okay. was me, and and ah. and that was me that crossed the street and to the National Cathedral. <coughs> and heard Dr. King speak. Um, it's a very personal book for me, but it's also an important book about what we discuss, which is how revolution can change society. Mm -hmm. And um, a, another big book for me was The Night Gardener, which I think you of also course. mentioned. Um, that sort of changed my career in the sense that it put me on the bestseller list, The New York Times, and um, it, it got me to another level, but there was a lot of, you know, books like King Sucker Man, things like that did a lot for me in that they kind of got me big overseas, uh, or they gained a bigger readership overseas, much more relatively speaking, a much bigger readership than I had in the United States. Mm. And it bounced back across the Atlantic and journalists were looking at what they were writing about me in Europe and they were saying, who is this guy? We don't even know who he is. So it helped me. Some of those early books helped me, um, help my career in the United States actually by, by making, uh, an imprint in Europe. And that was in, it was in Greece and it was put in places like France and, and, uh, and England, um, which has been very, very helpful for me. Yes. Uh, I, I will, uh, um, uh, talk about these, uh, these books and, and say the, the Greek titles. The, the, the first you, you were talking about, the a firing offense, it's Phlegomeni Poli, Ekdosis Oxy. And then there are uh, other um, of your, uh, the novels that we can find in, in Greece in, and in Greek is uh, O Vasilias του Pezodromiu, Dilima Dikeu, O Kipuros της Nichtas. Το Αδιέξοδο, η Προμήθεια, το Δίδυμο, uh, and uh, now ο, ο, ο άντρας που επέστρεψε από τις εκδόσεις what, Πατάκη. What does that mean? Uh, I, I, I was uh, uh, saying, I was talking about the, the, the titles of your novels in, oh, yeah. in Greek. I know. <laughs> I mean, the last one. What is, what's the translation for the, for the o, last one? O Andras που επέστρεψε is the, 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 the man who came back. Returned? Who returned, yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. I remember that. Yes. Yeah, that all, all that stuff gets run by me. You know, they ask me, yeah. what are you thinking? <laughs> Sometimes I don't like it. Sometimes I do. The man who returned is pretty good. Yes. No, no, Andonis Kalokiris is a very, very good uh, translator. I would like to, to uh, read this um, a small passage in the Greek edition, is uh, page uh, 71, uh, where, the, where Michael thinks about the transformative, um, the transformative power of, of, of books. And I like it very much. Um, when he read a book, it's page 71 in the novel, okay. when he read a book, 
the door, the door to his cell was open. He could step right through it. He could walk those hills under the, bl um, under the big blue sky, breathe the fresh air around him, see the shadows moving over trees. When he read a book, he was not locked up. He was free. It's very important, and we need to, to, uh, to keep it in mind because we love books and we are in the Thessaloniki International Book Fair and it, will be, it would be nice if we had uh, you uh, in person, but uh, this will, uh, will come uh, maybe one of the next years. Uh, tell me, um, what, uh, what is it that you are interested in when you hear about Greece? Well, um, I, you know, I'm, I keep up with the politics. I read as much as I can, and 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 uh, I'm interested in the changes. You meant you mentioned uh, gentrification, and um, whenever I come back to Greece, it, you know, when you're when you're not there for a while, you really notice the changes. So when I come back, it's always much more advanced. Um, and, and, um, you know, the people were, when, when I came, when I came, uh, when I came, when I was a kid, there was still the, the, you know, the, the Curios and the people in the Capaneos that, you know, it, it was old Greece in a way in the, in the, in the sixties and seventies when I was a child. And now it's, it's modern Greece. It's like everywhere. It's, it's much more like um everywhere you go mm. you know what i mean and that's true of that's true of um of any place you know the 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 what we've lost and what we've lost here in washington um it's very nice here in washington the crime is down the uh the amenities are nicer the the livings you know quarters are nicer but we lost a lot of the character because when i was a kid um when I was a kid, the city was 75, 80% black. Mm. It was a black city with a lot of soul, man. I mean, that's what got me interested in, in writing about Washington was, mm -hmm. it was a very cool place for somebody like me to grow up. And so it's nicer now, but it's lost a lot of its character. And, and I see that all over the world. Now I'm not saying that in Greece, that Greece has lost its character, but it is a different, it is a different Greece and that, that interests me. Um, that's the main thing that interests me is those changes and how they, how they affect society. And, and, you know, like just an example is you couldn't even, uh, when I went to Greece, when I was uh, a teenager and I met one of my cousins, she couldn't get Rolling Stone magazine or, or things like that until six months after they were published here in the, um, United States. And now it's for anybody in Greece or anywhere, it's instant. You get on the laptop and you get all the same information that I get. Um, yes, and, and, and many that's, times that's we the, we are more yeah. informed than you <laughs> because we have a, a, a wide range of uh, interests. Yeah. yeah, it's it's um, it's been revolutionary, but I'm not sure that it's great. I I, I I'm really um, concerned with social media that the downside of social media is that people get a lot of information, too much information. And a lot of it is, is, uh, is wrong. It's misinformed. Sometimes it's outright lies and you can't tell the difference. And there's, 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 there are a few places to get news anymore. That is just news where somebody is, either writing the facts or reading the facts to a, to a TV monitor. It's always tinged by, it's always affected by, um, by bias on both sides, the left and the right. It's hard to find unbiased information anymore. And, and that's been the downsides of, of this, um, of this internet revolution is that, um, and that's part of the reason that there's been so much violence here in the United States is people get on their, on their laptop, they'll get on Facebook and they'll see something that's just, it's a lie. 
but they believe it because they're so used to reading these lies every day. And then they get angry and then they go out in the street. That's not a good thing. I got off I got off topic a little bit, but it does it does I know that this is true in Greece also, mm-hmm. is that this this is not a positive thing uh, to have all this misinformation hitting people all the time. It's not a good thing. Yes, in, in Greece it it's, uh, happens very often. But you're talking about uh, violence and I think you are dealing with violence from everywhere it comes, not only from the violent people or the bad uh, people uh, in, your, in your novels. And this is, I think, a, a, a very big issue uh, nowadays, uh, violence. Um, yeah. <laughs> in, in, um, in, in the United States, it, it seems that it has uh, risen. I, I, I don't know. Uh, this is the, what? what we feel about it. But I, As far as the police go, you know, I've, I come at it from a little bit of a different perspective than, than most white people in this country because... I raised two black sons and a, and a Latina daughter, you know, and my children are all grown now. They're in their 20s and almost 30 years old. So I, I don't, you know, it's different now. But when they were growing up, I had to worry about them every time they left the house. And, and I had to and 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 most of my worry was not from uh, them getting in trouble with other kids or violence from other kids. It was from the police, mm. and uh, this is this is a real thing. It's not something that's made up. It's not anti-police. I don't, I'm not against the police. I want the police to protect us, and and this 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 movement to defund the police is entirely wrong. You don't want to defund the police. The police need more money for training, uh, better salaries that that um, that attract more educated people and you know we want police to protect us yes but not kill want... not kill you i mean all this uh, george floyd thing and 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 everything it was it was it's been, hard it's been going on for it's been going on forever it's just coming to light and and actually i'm working on a uh, show right now we're writing it for hbo about the police in baltimore Mm-hmm. And uh, because they had a squad of police that were, bad, you know, dirty cops and they all got sent up to prison. But they were doing things like they were robbing drug dealers. They were doing home invasions. They were selling drugs on the street. And but a lot, but also what they were doing was they were trampling on the rights of citizens. They were arrest, planning evidence, arresting people for, for no reason. And we're, we're going to write about that and we're going to shoot it next year. Um, and we're going to try and answer the question of, instead of just saying this is bad, we're going to try to answer the question of why it happens. Why? Why, yeah. That's the big, that's the big thing, and it's what we've always done. It's what we did on The Wire, too. You know, if you watch The Wire, season four was about the kids, and you followed these kids through their school year. Well, you know, every, I've been hearing all my life, why can't black kids get out of the ghetto? Why can't they just work hard like we did? You know what I mean? We showed why. We answered the why. Do you believe that this movement, Black Lives Matter, can uh, help uh, to this? Uh, um, I yes, know. I do. In, in what way? It makes people aware. It, it's, it started a lot of arguments. Some of the arguments have gotten violent. But again, you need this sort of, um, the violence is sometimes necessary to get us to a place where, where we can uh, eventually reconcile and, and, and go forward. It ha- it's happened before. It happened in the late 60s. And the 70s were, was a very peaceful time in this country in a lot of ways where uh, people decided, all right, we're going to try to do better. And I think that's going to happen after this. We've got a new president. He's, he's not, uh, he's not left wing. He's a moderate. He wants to be the president for all Americans. He doesn't want to divide us. And 
Um, and I think things are going to be better. A after January 20th, you're going to see things calm down here. We hope. <laughs> we hope. I do hope. I'm an optimist. I, I yes. look. I, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning if I didn't if I didn't have hope. You know what I mean? And 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 your your children do they uh, uh, do they have a, a sort of a Greek culture or any connection with, with with Greece or not anymore? I mean, in the third generation, uh, uh, you have lost the the connection with uh, Greek culture or Greek. Yeah, well, there's going to be a natural uh, there's going to be a natural drop off there, but I did. Um, I raised my kids in, at St. Sophia, mm -hmm. and my sons, like I did, they played basketball for the church, <laughs> which is what, you know, it's a brilliant thing, the Goya, Greek Orthodox Youth of America. This basketball program keeps boys in the church when they're teenagers. Otherwise, we'd never go to church. And my sons played basketball. They made a lot of lifelong friends like I did. I'm still friends with the guys that I grew up with in the church, and they will be too. So that's, you know, they're they're not Greek, but they feel like uh, uh, they they feel like they have Greek in them. My oldest son speaks Greek, um, and uh, you know, it, it's been good. It's this the idea is this is how it worked for me, and I think it's going to how it's going to work for my children. Is um, my parents are gone, they're deceased, but when I go to church and I and I. Um, and I see their, their friends and the children of their friends and so on. I, I'm with my parents again and it's, and it, and it's good to be part of a larger community. I'm not talking about, um, I'm not talking about God now. I'm talking yes. about, community. about the social uh, community. Yes. Yeah. Because we never in, in America, we didn't have really, uh, there was very few Greek towns. Greeks lived together. Yes. One. So the church became that place where you community once a week and made and made lifelong relationships. It's very important. Yes, I cannot hear you very uh, well now. I I think that there has been a, a, a bit. Uh, um, I don't know. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Uh, something uh, uh, happened in the uh, the wire. <laughs> um, have you read any any um, Greek novel? I mean, any novels translated in in uh, English by by Greek writers? Do you know any any one of them of the new generation? Maybe. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking right now because there was a Greek. Guy that sent me a book that was pretty good. Okay. Um, it, hold on one second. I got it right yeah. here. Makis Tsitas. Makis God Tsitas. is my witness. Yes, Makis Tsitas. Yeah, you, yeah. you know it? Uh, yes. It's pretty good. Yes. I liked it. He has, okay. You know, it's it's difficult <laughs> for a, for a Greek writer to be uh, translated in the, um, the Anglo-Saxon uh, market is very difficult for for Greeks. It's uh, rather um, closed, while Greeks get uh, translated I, easier I in in, in uh, Spanish or in Italian or in German or in French, less in uh, yeah. We don't get a lot English. of we don't get a lot of Greek novels yeah. here um unless you're katanzakis you know yeah uh <laughs> but they're still in print but there, there are not, some it's not uh, a yeah there are some uh, greek writers who have been uh, uh, lately uh, translated it's uh, sofia nikolaidou um christos ikonomou christos chrysopoulos uh young uh, the younger generation and they are uh, strong and Mike Tsitas, you know him. Uh, so we will. Uh... Yeah, we <laughs> yes, we, um, we must. I mean, listen. I hope. Look, man, it's a it's a, it's a global. Um, that's the good thing about the internet is that that you could you could put a book out, 
here okay. and it can get translated right on your laptop. Now the translation isn't going to be great, but at least you can read it, you know? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you know, when, when <laughs> you have seen, uh, uh, when you, you like uh, fiction, you need a, a good translation because it uh, keeps... Uh, I agree. Uh, you, you are very well translated in Greece, and this, um, this changes things for, for the readers. Uh, we feel uh, uh, closer to you. Uh, I think we have uh, come to the end of our uh, discussion. Uh, I don't know if you want to um, send a message to your Greek readers, and then we can say goodbye. To the next well first thank you for your uh you, you did great i appreciate you and, you are uh, great and you just, make things easier <laughs> thanks yeah. uh no my message is peace that's it that's how i want to sign out peace okay okay we well, thank you very much and uh, you. hope to see you <laughs> in person next time me too yes me too thank okay. you Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.